keys out, right? And say, my car key represents how people look at me. My house key represents where I look, where I live. My, my, the, the key to my office represents what I do for a living. And I'm going to give all these keys to you because you're the driver. And so I just, um, I think that's the place for us to start this morning. Would you just open up your hands with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have given your life that we might have life. And just as each many of us were baptized many years ago and said, in recognition of you, I'm going to give my life to you because you gave your life to me. We do that again this morning. All that we have, all that we are, all that we hope to be, we give to you. Come, Holy Spirit, bring an encounter, a truth encounter, a love encounter, and a power encounter with you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So let's give our bodies and our souls to the Lord this morning. We can see that God are moving a mighty river through the nations when a young and old return to Jesus. We sing a fling wide, you heavenly gates, prepare the way of the risen Lord. Come on, let's sing that again. We see. Can see and we can see that God you're moving a mighty river through the nations when a young and old will turn to Jesus. Come on, hey. fling wide you heavenly gates, prepare the way of the risen Lord. Feel the mountains tremble. Did you hear the oceans roar when the people rose to sing? Jesus Christ, the risen one. I want to sing that out. Did you feel? Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar when the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one? We can see, now we can see that God, you're moving a mighty river through the nations when a young and old return to Jesus. Come on, go oh, fling wide, you heavenly gates. Prepare the way of the risen Lord. Open up. Let's sing it out. Come on. Open up the doors.
So I'm going to challenge you. I see this section over here already engaging with their bodies and the, with the Lord. And so I want to challenge you, if that's in your space today, that you need to engage with the Lord and hear the places of where he's trembling, hear the places of his breakthrough. I want to challenge you to kind of get moving with your body, move those steps. It doesn't matter how old you are, but we're going to sing these songs. We're going to shout some simple melodies to the Lord together and just sing to our Lord in this place. And so we welcome you, Jesus. Come. Come and have your way. Come on. So sing, open up the door. Then. Sing, open up the door.
nothing less than Jesus Christ's unrighteousness. I did not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ Yeah. 
We want to stay in that place of worship as we take some time to pray this morning. Um, one of the things that we get to do is we get to lift up different things that are going on through this family, through this house. And this morning, uh, we want to focus on one of our people, one of our teams that's overseas serving in the Middle East. And so my name's Carol, and I'm our international director um, for ministry. And we want to take some time to focus on the Kerner family this morning who are serving in the Middle East. We want to pray that God would move through what's going on in that place and just, just give you some vision. The Kerners have been serving in the Middle East for quite some time. They have six children, two children under two, as God blessed them through this last several years with that. And they currently, um, Jason is um, in Syria right now, and they are distributing different packets to winterize uh, different refugee camps that are going on there. And while they've been there, they have seen God move in powerful ways. They've encountered people that are open and hungry for the gospel, and they've also encountered people that have experienced um, a lot of suffering for the name of Jesus. And so we want to take some time. There's some prayer points that are up on the screen if you feel comfortable gathering with some people. But we want to intercede. God is moving on the earth. He is. He's moving in powerful and awesome ways. And it says that the prayers of a righteous man, a righteous woman are powerful and effective. And so as we pray into what God is doing in this place, he is shifting hearts. He is rebuilding foundations. He is setting people free. And so let's pray bold prayers this morning with our prayers. Let's believe and step in faith that as we pray, pray, he's setting this nation free, that he is bringing healing and restoration. So gather together and let's pray for this place and this family this morning.
Jesus, we thank you for this family that has said yes to pouring out your presence in a place that doesn't yet know you. And so, God, we just ask right now for the Kerner family that you would be with Jason, that you would be with Sarah, that you would be with all of their kids, God, in this moment, that you would continue to pour out your dreams and visions for this nation, this land, this people group to them. And God, we thank you for the work that you're doing in Syria. We thank you, God, for the ways that you are rebuilding the ancient foundations, God, that you're restoring things that have been stolen from this nation, God. And Lord, we thank you for the ways that you're pouring out dreams and visions to men and women in that country, that they're meeting you, that they're seeing you, and that they're knowing that there is hope that comes through a man, and his name is Jesus. And so, God, we do just ask that you would continue to set this nation free, that the Middle East would see revival, that they would see revival of Jesus coming on, as you've spoken, that you'll come on that white horse, God. And so, Lord, we do just ask that there would be a pouring out of your spirit in ways that this nation, these places, would be able to know who you really are. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you can all have a seat this morning, we're also going to take time to, to pray over our offering. So on the screen, there's different ways that you can give online, or there's also a box in the back if you want to give. But we believe that God wants to move through the ways that we give, and that he wants to touch this nation, this city, and the nations of the earth. So I'm going to pray for that this morning. Jesus, we thank you for the ways that you have blessed us, the ways that you've taken care of us, the many stories in this house of the ways that you have provided when we need provision. And so God, we just give out of that place of the ways you've taken care of us and the ways that you've blessed us and the ways that you've watched over us. We give it back to you, God. And we trust God that out of the ways that we give, that you're gonna see um, that being blessed to this city, this nation and the nations of the earth so we bless it and say lord breathe on it let it multiply that men and women in this city in this nation and the nations of the earth would come to know you in jesus name amen amen thank you carol hey everyone my name is mel bryan uh, feel free to have a seat if you haven't we've got some more chairs on the side and thanks for joining us all of you at home i'm glad you brought your own chairs Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mel Bryan and here at Epicenter Church, uh, we encounter God, we change the world and we make disciples. Um, we encounter God by learning to hear his voice. We change the, girl, the world in many different ways um, through uh, different things we're doing in our community, through ways that we're reaching out to, to different nations and just so many ways, which you could hear more of here at the Connection Center or at epicenter.org slash connect. Um, on that note, uh, we have this huge event coming up, um, February 27th, Mission Sunday, where we get to be with not just our church family here, but our uh, extended family, our West LA Church, our East LA Church, our Lincoln Heights Church. Is anybody excited for that? Yeah. And Irvine. Don't forget Ben. Yeah, so um, we will be at the auditorium. We'll be on this campus, but not in this building. So you will probably see signs around. Uh, this is a service that you'll have to register for. Uh, there will also be a lunch where we can have lunch with our extended family as well. And service for that, that day starts at 11 a.m. So it's an hour later. Feel free to sleep in just a little bit, but not too long. Make sure you're here on time at 11 a.m. There's no excuse to be late. Um, also, we have a, uh, an info meeting next week for our Afghan refugee ministry. Um, it'll be right in the pergola over here. You know, we've been doing a lot with that, and next week you'll get to hear a, an awesome testimony during our announcement time. Um, Pastor Josh will lead that time, and, and yeah, like, come, come to that. There's some awesome things happening. Lastly, we have our uh, spring break Verge trip for college. You can, you can find out more from Pastor Cam, or you can ask Hope. She's here in the second row. Um, or ask a college student, because I'm sure a lot of them are going. It's going to be an awesome trip in, in Mexico um, with the Huichol people. 
So sign up, talk to, talk to Cam, talk to Hope. And yeah, right now, uh, I want to invite you all to, to greet each other. Um, ask, ask, ask someone what their favorite uh, childhood breakfast was. And the third person to ask me will get a breakfast burrito. All right. Oh, lastly, let me, let me release the children. So Father God, uh, let's all extend a hand to our children. Um, and God, we just pray that you bless our kids, Lord. I pray that you just make them sponges and allow them to really get to know you, um, know your heart and feel your embrace. And Father God, we just pray that you bless our Kingdom Kids workers as well, our volunteers, our serve team, God. Um, may they go in peace to love and serve you. Amen. Well, I am so grateful that you're all here. Mel Bryan got us thinking about how hungry we are, and that's really good because uh, we are in the last day of our fast, and I hope that you've been that God's been stirring for you a hunger for His Word. So, um, let me just say one thing before I introduce Ed. Um, our CCC, our Clergy Co Coalition Community, is sponsoring uh, a prayer for our city tonight at 6 p.m. And so uh, please in, uh, tune in on Zoom. Um, there's a, a number of issues, as you know, uh, besieging our city. Uh, and there's been a lot of shootings. And we they're in the middle of choosing a new city manager as well as a new police chief. And so change is afoot and it's really, it gives us an opportunity to pray into the new leadership here in Pasadena. Well, um, Ed and Ruth, would you just stand? I just want to honor this uh, grandfather and grandmother of the faith. As you'll hear soon, um, Ed's, they've, they've come from Argentina uh, and have been living here in the States, uh, but mobilizing people all throughout the world for uh, just uh, the, the whole aspect of how you, what you and I are called to as believers and the calling that we have to be agents of change and transformation in our world. And so I just want you to do something because this kept happening to me. I kept, Ed would say these things that were kind of like mic drops and it was like pew, mind blown. So I just want you to get ready. Okay, ready? Go like this. Pew. There's just a whole bunch of those things that are going to happen. But what I, I'm, I want us to pray for is that it's not just this, but this. That the eyes of our heart be open so that we hear the invitation from God to your true self. So would you just stand as we welcome Ed and let's just pray for our hearts in this time. God, we just thank you so much for Ed and the, the weekend and the time that he and Ruth have been giving us. And we ask that you sow seed that comes from the heart of God and that here in this place and online, that uh, soil, that those seeds find soil that's 30, 60, and 100 fold out into the fields. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful pastor you have. Give him a hand. Would you do that? <laughs> Folks, uh, 
We have intercessors all over the world. We have about 20,000 of them in Argentina. And all they do is pray because they are in prison. They have come to the Lord through a power encounter and they are on the double praying for you right now, even though they don't know your name. So we have some heavy guns because the Lord is showing that something extraordinary will happen in your life today that will impact your family and eventually your sphere of influence so that this city and the city where you live will become God's city. Can I get an amen to that? But we are going to submit to God and oppose the devil so that he will flee. And to lead in a prayer, I'm going to invite my best friend, my personal intercessor, my wife of many, many years, Ruth. Would you like to lead it? Uh, thank you. It's so good to be here with you. And the presence of the Lord is so strong today. So we know that the Lord is going to speak to us today. Let's be open to receive everything that the Lord has for us today. Amen. Amen. So would you stand up where you are? And we're going to pray together. Rather than me praying, we are all going to pray together. And I want you to repeat this prayer, but put some Tabasco sauce or soy sauce on your voice, okay? Because after we submit to God, we are going to oppose the devil, as the Bible says. And I don't want you to sound like an anemic, bulimic, effeminate policeman. Say, oh, Mr. Devil, I hate to inconvenience you. No, I want you to roll like a lion here and all over the internet. Roll like a lion because soon God will crush Satan under your feet. It is written. So, shall we pray? Remember the Tabasco sauce. Father God, let it be known in heaven and on earth that here now, today, we, your people, your ecclesia, are gathered in the name that is above all names. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And we submit to God. We come under his wings. And in the name of Jesus, we oppose the devil. And we command him in Jesus' name. Be gone. Be gone from my mind, from my family, from my job. Right now, be gone in Jesus' name. Father God, bless the person on my right. Bless the one on my left. Touch them. Bless them. Heal them. Deliver them. Prosper them. Let your kingdom come. And we declare to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west, yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. And yours is the glory. Forever. Amen. And now give a big, big shout and a big, big hand to the Lord. Come on. And before you sit down, whether here or out there, look at somebody in the eye and tell that person, I love you and there is nothing you can do about it. Come on. <clears throat> Folks, uh, we have had a terrific time with your pastors, Pastor John, Pastor Evelyn, and with some of you yesterday over a very, very um, anointed lunch. And, um, and our, by the grace of God, we lead a network of about 10,000 plus influencers all over the world. Some of them are youth like you, collegians, middle-aged people, and people that believe that by the grace of God, we can change the world for our Lord to return. 
One of the biggest lies the devil has sold us under the label of theology is that the Lord has to return for the world to change. No. He's at the right hand of the Father waiting for everything to be put under his feet. The gospel of the kingdom has to be preached all over before the Lord will return. And so we are going to talk about that and God will impart to you today. I'll be using PowerPoints and if we can have those on display, it will help you because what you hear and what you read, you know, you retain better. But let's talk about the issue of faith. So often we think that faith is like money in our pocket. How much money do I have and how much can I afford? And they will say, no, I don't have enough faith. No, I cannot do that. Well, that is true to a certain degree. But I want to add another dimension. When it comes to faith, it doesn't matter how much faith you have in God. What matters is how much faith God has in you. Because when God has faith in you, that produces faith in you to rise up. Take the case of Gideon in the book of Judges, chapter 6. The guy is a coward. He's hiding wheat in the wine cellar to go and hide in the cave from where he will watch the Midianites eat everything that he has saved. And an angel comes and calls him mighty warrior. He was not a warrior. He was not mighty but God was calling him not for what he was, but for what he will become. And listen to the Holy Spirit now. I mean, it doesn't matter how many defeats you have had. God sees a winner in you, and he calls you a mighty warrior. And in one of my books, I tell the story, you know, I spent my summers in my grandpa ranch in Argentina. I began at age five, and every summer I went there, and I loved my grandpa. And he gave me a horse, a pinto horse, and taught me so many things. And to me, he was the closest thing to God. He was a widower. And one morning I woke up. And my grandpa doesn't look like a happy camper. He's looking out the window and he sees a bull that has broke through, broken through a fence and led a herd of cows into a field that was ready for harvest and they were having Christmas in July. And I knew that that was going to be a difficult day because that bull was a very clever bull. If he would have been born in Cuba, he would have taught Castro how to do the right revolution. <laughs> Had so many leadership abilities, could put the team together, could strategize. He was known all over the region. And I said, it's going to be a long day. But my grandpa can do it. But then he turned to me, to little tiny me, seven years old, and she says, saddle up, go and get them. And I said, what? I don't like to be repeated. Saddle up, go and get them. Me, little me, I don't have the faith. He did have the faith in me. And in those days, for you millennials, we have to respect our elders, you know. <laughs> Whatever they told you, you did. You never argue, right? We have 12 grandkids with Ruth. And I'll tell you, I get very little respect. They tell me what to do, to shut up. No, you don't know. But I'm talking way back there, okay? Your grandpa says, saddle up, go and get them. <laughs> Even if you don't believe it, you do it. And I went to the back patio and I saddled my horse, Manchado, and I was galloping like a, the Sargento Garcia in the Zorro series, you know, that he never wins, you know, so this is going to be terrible. And I felt like eating sweet and sour Chinese food, you know. Half of me says, I can do it, and the other half says, I cannot do it. But why was I going? And this is the lesson, because my grandpa had the faith in me. And then it took me several hours. I round them up and I fixed the fence. And when I was galloping back to the ranch, I was wondering if my grandpa would be happy about it. Now, my grandpa was born in the 19th century, 
Men in those ages don't smile. If you have the picture of them, they look serious. They sat at the table. I mean, if they talk, you talk. And if they didn't talk, you keep quiet. But I knew something. When he was happy, there was a glint in his beautiful blue eyes. And I'm riding the horse and wondering, I mean, he will not be like today. How are you doing? Did you have a bad day? They never ask you that. But I said, I'm going to watch if the glint is there. And when I pull up into the patio, he has already tied up a horse to a buggy. He said, hop on, we are going to town. And I look, and the glint was there. He was proud of me. He wasn't saying it. And we went to the little town and walked into a cantina. We have done that before. And he was very quiet. But this time, he kind of kicked the door and said to the bartender, the usual, which was grappa for him and granadine for me, for my partner and I. Partner, me, little me. And then he sat telling them, and because that bull had a missionary mindset, has been to so many fields, you know, everybody knew what the bull has done. And they said, and he did it. And that day I realized that I did it, not because I believe I could, but because he believed I could and I should. So listen to the Holy Spirit now and let the Lord impart faith to you right now that if I have to summarize in one phrase, what the Lord laid on my heart is this, for you to love Mondays, as much as you love Sundays, that you will wake up tomorrow fully convinced that greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world, because God has faith in you. So I want to put a mirror before you, and you tell yourself what you see. When Christians are in the marketplace, whether it be a school, business, education, government, I mean, where you spend the bulk of your time Monday through Friday, they fit in one of four levels. And the very basic level is people who simply survive in the marketplace. I mean, <laughs> they come to church on Sunday, they get a boost, and then they get deflated progressively. And the next Sunday they crawl in, Pastor, Pastor, pray for me. That is not the will of God. Because Jesus says, I will build my church, and you are the church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail. But the next level up, and this is where most Christians are, are Christians who enjoy or practice um, biblical principles in the marketplace. And they have a chat room, they have a prayer group during the break, you know, they talk to other Christians, they build each other up, and that's okay. But what is not okay is that they do that not to change the marketplace, but for the marketplace not to change them. So that they settle for a tie rather than for a victory. And if you play for a tie, you never win the championship. You know, you have to go for it. So if you're at that level, great. But today, you will move up to the next level. What is the next level? Christians who apply biblical principles and operate in the marketplace in the power of the Holy Spirit. That sounds like a contradiction. Because when we look at biblical principles or a spiritual gift, we think of exercising them in a home group, in a, in a Sunday school. But the Bible says that God has given you gift. The Holy Spirit has given you gift. And Paul explains that those gifts are for the common good. Say common. And now say common good. Common is the root word for community. Community in the Bible is the word oikos. It's where you live, it's where you work. So that whatever the spiritual gift you have is for the betterment of the environment where you are. 
And if you spend the bulk of your time in school, in college, in the marketplace, you are the ecclesia. Great that is he who is in you. And you should go there and exercise what gift? Gift of knowledge, wisdom, evangelism, mercy, compassion, faith. So in one of my books, I tell the story of a lady that was an up-and-coming uh, CEO in a Fortune 500 company. And one day she realized, I am a minister. And that company is my parish. And the people that I work with are members of my congregation, even though they don't know I am their pastor. And then she accepted the call. And she says, and then Monday through Friday, she spent time in prayer before going to work, seeking God for uh, mergers and acquisitions, for profit and loss. I mean, things that you deal with because the lives of people are depending on that. And one day the Holy Spirit activated the word of knowledge gift and revealed to her that the recent acquisition was not a good one because the guy who sold them that company had cooked the books. And so she took notes and then she asked for a meeting with the CFO and disclosed what she heard without telling him who she heard it from. And the guy says, my, 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 this is heavy stuff. Do you have it from a reliable source? She said, oh yes, how reliable. Absolutely reliable. Who is your source? And she felt embarrassed. So she said, I'd rather keep it confidential. And the guy said, no, tell me. Yes, no, yes, no. Finally, the guy pulled right. He said, tell me, or else. And she said very timidly, God. And the guy says, what does God have to do with a Fortune 500? And she tried to explain that Daniel, Joseph, Esther, they received divine revelation for people who are non-believers to change empires. But the guy was not buying. And she said, you better be sure. Because I'm going to send the team there. And they're going to double check. And for about a week or ten days, she wondered, I'm sure. Did I hear God? Or have I eaten too much pepperoni pizza the night before? Because her life, her position was on the line. But about 10 days later, the guy came back and said, I want you to know everything you told me, check out. Now I have two questions. What else did God tell you? And did he tell you anything about me? <laughs> you see, she was elevated. And that is God's destiny for you in your school, in your university, in the workplace. Place. I mean, that is your parish. You are the ecclesia. You are to take the goodness of God there. Like you may say, but Ed, I am not a CEO. I'm young. I'm beginning. Well, let me introduce you to Juan Lapa. Juan Lapa was in Thailand, a lady, an spiritist who was dying of cancer, a stage four, very advanced, and she had a child. And she knew that the child was a left orphan. And she reached out to Pastor Brian Burton and said, would you take care of my child when I die? And the pastor says, I will, but let me pray for God to heal you because God heals. And she did. And she was miraculously healed. And then she began to tell everybody about it, but she didn't get many people to come to the Lord until the pastor came to one of our conferences in Argentina and learned about prayer evangelism, Luke 10. You bless the people, you fellowship with them, you minister to them, and then and only then you preach to them. And because she was an spiritist before, she couldn't go back to that line of work. So the pastor bought her that tricycle and that motorcycle and gave her enough money uh, to, to sell ice cream. But she said, I am not an ice cream seller. I am a minister. This is not a tricycle. This is a chariot of fire. And then she anointed with oil the, 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 the trailer and then lay hands on the carton of ice cream and said, Lord, cause everybody who eats this ice cream to feel your presence. 
And as people were approaching, she began to zap them with the blessing. <laughs> Lord, she looks depressed. I bless her. This one is on witchcraft. I break it without telling them. And she changed the spiritual climate around that ice cream cart. And people thought that she had changed brands and bought more ice cream. No, it was anointed ice cream. And by the way, God loves to anoint food. I mean, my wife wrote the book. It's there on the book table, Faith uh, Building Stories, where you can cook under the anointing, where you can bless people who are not believers by giving them a cup of tea that you prepare in the name of the Lord. And that lady, listen carefully, in one year led 700 people to the Lord that got baptized and joined the church. But because she knew that the finish line was not the bigger church, she said, we need to reach the governor. But how can you reach the governor if you're an ice cream vendor in the streets of Thailand? But she said, I don't care what he thinks. He's my sheep. And every day she parked the trailer and threw a blessing over the wall. And say, Lord, whatever he is, bless him, touch him. Because that's what Luke 10 says. You are lambs, they are wolves. Speak peace over them. And one day the governor opened the door and bought an ice cream. He didn't know it was an anointed ice cream. And the moment that he licked it, he had a power encounter. <laughs> and then the lady saw the opening and said, you should come to church. Now, that was a 90-yard field goal attempt. I mean, this is Thailand, okay? Less than one-tenth of one percent are Christian, and he's inviting the governor to come to an evangelical church. But she was under the anointing. And she said, where is your church? And Sunday morning, the governor walked through the front door. The problem is she didn't tell the pastor that she invited the governor who was Mr. Corruption and the pastor is preaching from my book Transformation paradigm number five that to eliminate poverty we have to uproot corruption <laughs> and who is walking through the door Mr. Corruption and so the pastor begins to have a conversation with God and says God I'm already halfway in why is he here and God told him, you asked me for sinners. I sent you the very best one. <laughs> but, he, but he can revoke my visa. Well, I can revoke your next breath. Take your choice. <laughs> and then under the rest, he preached, you know, the love of God and the power of God. And, uh, and the governor's face got longer and longer. And he left without saying goodbye. And the pastor told his wife, they are British missionaries. Honey, we better pack because he's going to call me and he's going to kick me out. Sure enough, on Thursday, he gets a call. And the governor invites him to lunch at a very fancy restaurant. And she says, isn't that cute? Before he kicks me out, he's going to feed me, you know, <laughs> like Abraham with Hagar, right? I mean, give her some food to get lost. And he goes there and the governor says, Sunday, I was at your church. Yes, I noticed. <laughs> And you preach against corruptions. Yes, I remember. <laughs> and I didn't like it a bit. Uh oh, that's the first shoe. Here comes the second one. And I didn't like it a bit. Listen carefully. And he reached under the table and pulls up a bag with a million dollars. Because the week before, I required a million dollar bribe from a construction company to authorize the opening of a hospital. And then I realized that I didn't take a million dollars from a construction company. I took it from the poor people of Phuket, Thailand, who will get the inferior services. And now this guy who has never been to an evangelical church, have never heard the gospel, asked the question, do you think Jesus can help me? That's like going fishing, and before you throw the line, the biggest fish jump in the boat, kisses you on both cheeks, and asks you for direction to the frying pan. 
And so right there, he led him to the Lord. Now the guy says, okay, you keep the million. I don't want it. And they are playing ping pong with a million dollars. And then the governor, just a believer by three minutes, says, I think we should give it to the poor people of Phuket. And they set up a fund. But what we learn, folks, is when you lead someone to the Lord, don't just lead the person. Lead the household of the person. Or else they're going to be prisoners there. And so he invited the governor to invite Jesus into the government. And he did. And he appointed the pastor, are you ready? Minister of Righteousness. And she says, every Monday you come and we're going to go through my agenda and everything that is crooked, we're going to make it right. And in one year alone, Seven million dollars were returned in bribes that went to the poor. Listen to the Holy Spirit. The whole creation in California is eagerly awaiting the manifestation of the children of God. But we have to move up on that scale. It's not enough to play for a tie. You have to believe that when you go to school or wherever you go, greater is he who is in you. And God loves the people there as much as he loves you. And God wants to use you to bless them so that they receive the Lord. In the old paradigm, you receive the Lord and he will forgive you and he will bless you. It doesn't work that way. They have to be blessed so that they can come to the Lord. But it doesn't stop there. The next level is people who not only operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, but they do it to transform the marketplace. This is what is on your heart. This is what is in the heart of your pastor to transform Pasadena, to transform Southern California. That's why we came this week here, not to teach you something, but to confirm what you're already doing. Because Jesus is waiting for everything to be put under his feet. The gospel of the kingdom, which is more than the radio program, is taking the values of the kingdom all over must be preached so that he will return. And if you are a high-level executive, you have an example in that lady. If you are like an Ashton vendor, it doesn't matter. But I want to tell you a story from the San Francisco Bay Area, not the Bible Belt. That's where we live, the city of Vallejo. Right there, there is a businessman who had a company that moves a million passengers a year in school bus company. He came to a seminar and he heard my teaching on um, being anointed for business and, uh, and all his life he wanted to serve the Lord, but he never felt led to quit his job and go to Bible school because it didn't appeal to him. And he told us later on, I always felt like an ATM machine. Every time they touched me, it was for cash. And I wanted to do more than give cash. I wanted to be a minister. But the paradigm was, if you are a ministry, quit your job. And praise God for those that did, and they watch over us. But we should never dichotomize. And that day, I led the pastors. I taught on, you are a minister. And I led the pastors. I was first in line, repenting to them and asking forgiveness. And this guy went back to his company like a kid in a candy store. And he opened the door of the boardroom and invited Jesus to come in and asked the father to be the chair of the board. And Jesus is CEO and the Holy Spirit, the legal counsel. How can you lose with a team like that? And then he anointed every bus with oil and trained every bus driver as a pastor to the children at the time when the city had declared bankruptcy. And there was despair and, and pain and fear. And now you have 
these mobile arts of the covenant right all over the city taking the presence of God. The mayor became a Christian. The chamber of commerce, I mean, began to adopt Christian values. They adopted every school there and began to provide. His revenue grew progressively from 2 million to 8 million, eventually 14 million, because the more you give to a city, the more God will give to you. When it hit 14 million, an investment fund made him an offer that they were sure he will not refuse. But God says, don't sell up, sell down. Sell it to your employees using a stock purchase option. And, uh, and the employees bought it for no money. And now people that could have never owned anything, they own a company. And now the company grew to $21 million. But then they realized it's not enough to help the schools. It's not enough to help the government. We have to help the reentry population. The 78% of felons released from prison that are back in prison within three years and turned the prison into a training camp for crime. And they went to the head of the reentry program, and the guy, a non believer, says, You have no idea what you are asking for. These are criminals. The, some of them never work a single day in an honest job. But he insisted. And the guy says, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you my 10 worst cases. If you succeed with one, come back. And, and he has an academy where he trains people as professional drivers. All 10 graduated, all 10 found a job, none of them went back to prison. This is the seventh year or eighth year that everybody released from prison in Solano County, California, San Francisco Bay Area, who is remanded to Michael Transportation Academy, has found a job, okay, has graduated, and has not gone back to prison. Why? Why not? I mean, you are the ecclesia. The gates of Hades are all over, but you have the keys to the gates of Hades, which are the keys of the kingdom that you can turn around. So let me show you this short video clip about Michael Brown, so you will put a face to a name, and then we will come back to do more impartation. But watch it, saying, Lord, I want it, and I want it even more here. Let's go for it. Yes, there is evidence of trouble all around us, and yes, Vallejo has went through a bankruptcy. However, this is not the end of our story. Marketplace ministers and pulpit ministers have come together to bring transformation to our city. As an ecclesia, uh, we have been empowered with favor to serve. And so we have a connection with our community uh, in education, business, or even government. Um, all of those different agencies have come to us one time or another. Uh, currently in California, the recidivism rate for people going back to uh, state prison is like in 75%. We've partnered with the uh, Department of Probation to uh, minister to our reentry population. A lot of community-based organizations don't offer services for our population, meaning offenders who have felony convictions. And giving them employment opportunities is one of the things that the probation department sees as a major component for helping them gain independence. Otherwise, you know, the odds are against them. If you're coming out of incarceration um, and you have a record, the chances of you being successful are, are slim. Um, and so they provide a pathway for those folks um, where they can change their life, you know, literally 180 degrees. And using MTS Training Academy, it was a really good decision for us because they had wrapped their arms around the clients to help them be successful. They have taken young people that I personally know that have had nothing but difficulties in their life and have given them the opportunity to, to work in the industry, the transportation industry, 
and are now making good wages, have benefits, are homeowners, and are supporting their family. What more exciting thing can you have than that? When I look at MTS Training Academy, 100% placement for jobs is no less than amazing. We just left an amazing meeting with the chief of the Vallejo Police Department, and he shared with us some amazing news, how the crime rate is down, the homicides are down, burglaries, I mean, some crime rates as low as high as 400% are down in our city, and we know it's because the Ecclesia has come to the city of Vallejo that we have declared the city of God. And believe it or not, we pray for more public officials and more business leaders, as well as those who are hurting during the week than we would otherwise. My company is a transformation company, and the reason I say that because uh, we have taken steps to address the systemic poverty issue that we have all over the world. And the way that I address this issue is simply by selling my business to my employees. And so as of today, I'm no longer the owner of Michael's Transportation, but I'm the founder. So I sold 99% of my company to uh, my 120 employees. The Transformation Network, it has not only broadened my perspective on what I do as a businessman every day and how I impact my city, but I noticed that there's a greater impact even on the employees, that their job is, uh, is it's more than just a job, and they realize and they sense that they are a part of a greater movement and uh, that what they do every day really matters. When Michael Brown broke transformation to this company, we we'll never imagined how far that would go. We've come up with a lot of uh, innovative ideas in this industry that are actually cutting edge, that is allowing us to tap a greater market share. And I believe it's just because of our relationship with uh, uh, our call on our lives, and that we are not just called to disciple individuals, but I believe that God has called us to disciple uh, and mentor a industry and then in doing so, ultimately, the nation. As we have focused on transformation of our city, 2014 has really been a banner year for Michael's Transportation. This is the greatest year that we've ever had. We've expanded into new territory, and which has allowed us to expand our uh, sphere of influence. God has blessed me, has blessed my family, have blessed my business, I think we were probably doing maybe about $2 million in revenue back in 2002. Well, today we're pushing eight, nine million. This company has become a church right in the heart of the marketplace. It looks just like you. And so God wants to use every one of us to transform our city. He starts, first of all, transforming you. And when God transforms you, he transforms your family. And then the next thing you know, he's transformed your community, your city, the state, and the nation. And that's just how it works. It works on the inside out. Michael's Transportation is a marketplace ministry where kingdom business happens every day. Folks, that is happening not too far from here. Quite not here. So we need to adjust our paradigms that faith is what God has in you rather than just what you have in God. But we also have to understand that you are the church. And that when two or three of you get together, you can host the presence of Jesus. And, and it's not enough to understand that, but we have to receive the power to do that because he's sending you to disciple nations beginning with your family your neighborhood your sphere of influence you know so that the holy spirit will empower you beginning in pasadena in california in the u.s in canada and so forth so that one day california will be on that procession of saved nations led by a governor that is giving the honor and the glory of California to God. So in conclusion, folks, the key is this. God wants to perform 
extraordinary miracles. To see what you haven't seen, you have to begin to do what you haven't done. If you continue to do what you always do, you will always see what you always see. And I would like to close, even though if I run a little bit into the time, with an impartation for extraordinary miracles. I want you to read the text that is on the screen on the count of three. One, two, three. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Why are they, I mean, aren't miracles extraordinary in and of themselves? Yes. Why will the Bible qualify as extraordinary something that by nature is already extraordinary? Because those miracles didn't happen in the church building. They happened in the marketplace. Paul was making tents with Aquila and Priscilla under such an anointing that the perspiration of Paul transferred the anointing from his soul to his garments and those garments were touched people that were sick and oppressed and they were delivered. That's what makes them extraordinary and that's why in a matter of two years everybody in Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's our fervent prayer today, that you will get on a journey, beginning with the small miracles, but you will believe God for miracles. But there are some paradigms that have to change. And that's why, you know, I wrote the book, Anointed for Business, which is the one that touched Michael Brown. But the other one is Ecclesia. You are the church. And there I address the question, what happens here? What will it take for that to happen out there? So let me show you this short video clip and then we will do an impartation, okay? Let's go for introduction to the Ecclesia. What happens in church every Sunday is extraordinary. The word is preached, people worship God, there is repentance, reconciliation. Nothing comes a close second to that. But what must we do for that that happens once a week to happen every day out there in the marketplace? In this video that you're about to watch, I show you why, how, when, and where to do that. Watch it. As a pastor, you will be inspired. As a church member, you will be empowered. And the kingdom of God will manifest itself but the gates of Hades are currently ruled. So let's go now into the heart of the book that is sort of a manual for the principles that are being presented. Let me take you from the known to the unknown. These are very intriguing questions that gave birth to this book. Number one, if the church is so important, why did Jesus speak only twice about it? Furthermore, why is it that there are no instructions or a command on church planting in the New Testament, as important as church planting is? How does the church today compare to the ecclesia in the New Testament? Look at the metrics of the Ecclesia in the New Testament. Number one, members devoted to their teacher's leading. Number two, individual and corporate prosperity to meet the needs inside and outside of their circles. Number three, daily, daily numerical growth. Number four, ongoing and expanding favor with outsiders. And number five, signs and wonders what we call here divine downloads. It was definitely a different kind of church, or it looked different. It was always people, never buildings. It was vibrant, expansive, operating 24-7, unstoppable capacity for growth. It set the agenda rather than being an item on somebody else's agenda. So the question is, why such low performance and little social relevance today. Could it be that we have confined to four walls once a week 
what is meant to operate 24-7 all over the city in the marketplace. You see, the other side of the church is the kingdom of God. They go together. And when Jesus launched the church, he described the kingdom as leaven, light, water, salt. Leaven in a jar doesn't do what it's supposed to do. Light that is blocked creates darkness. Water that doesn't run becomes putrid. Salt in a shaker doesn't do any good to the meal. So we need to take this into society. Is there something that we have not tapped into yet? And if so, what is it? I mean, when Jesus introduced the ecclesia, his intention all along was to co-opt an existing secular institution and impregnate it with his kingdom DNA. Let me explain this by taking you back to the genesis of the ecclesia. There were three main institutions in Israel during New Testament days. Number one, the temple. Number two, the synagogue. Number three, the church, the ecclesia, the word translated church in our Bibles. The temple was a religious place where people met with representatives of God, the priest. The synagogue was another religious place where God's people met with each other. But the ecclesia, the ecclesia secular, was a Roman institution where it was an assembly of people deputized by the emperor to introduce and implement the laws of the empire. And the function of that ecclesia was to teach the language and the culture of Rome until everything and everyone walked, talked, and acted like Rome. Very interestingly, Jesus didn't say, I will build my temple or I will build my synagogue, but he said, I will build my ecclesia. Basically, what he was implying, there already exists an ecclesia, a secular one, which is governed by evil forces. They are called the gates of Hades. But I am releasing a new ecclesia, a group of people, because ecclesia means an assembly of people. And when these two meet, mind will win. Therefore, when the disciples heard the word ecclesia, they didn't need much explanation because the frame of reference was a secular entity already in existence in, a, in the marketplace, except that this new ecclesia was going to be Jesus' ecclesia. Pay attention to this. He co-opted a major institution that was operating in the marketplace with imperial authority and infused it with God's kingdom DNA. Number two, he went beyond that. He also co-opted the conventus, conventus civium romarorum, the correct word. And that meant that when Roman citizens met anywhere, the power and the authority of the emperor was with them. Isn't that what Jesus said about his church? When two or three of you get together, I am there in your midst. But it goes beyond that. He also co-opted the term apostle. Today is a religious term, but in Jesus' day, it described the admiral in charge of a fleet loaded with building materials and all kinds of people with building expertise, carpenters, plumbers, engineers, architects, that they were sent out to build in a new territory, a city that looked like Rome. So my friends, Reflect on this. He co-opted the ecclesia, he co-opted the conventus, and he co-opted the office of apostle. And that's why when you are commissioned as a minister in the marketplace, you are one of those ships taking building material to establish the kingdom of God in new territory. In the Bible, the ecclesia was a building-less, mobile people movement designed to operate 24-7 in the marketplace to impact everybody and also 
everything. By selecting the ecclesia model over the temple or the synagogue, Jesus chose an agency better suited to succeed in the marketplace because his ultimate objective was to see nations discipled by inserting the leaven of his kingdom into their social fiber through the ecclesia, which is people. Now, I'm going you to read out loud with me this uh, paragraph because it encapsulates the whole concept. Jesus' ecclesia was not meant to be a sterile, sanitized holding tank into which his disciples were to store in frozen isolation converts fish out of a turbulent and doomed sea to await the arrival of the refrigerator ship that will transfer them to a heavenly port for final processing. No, instead, his ecclesia, whether in the embryonic expression of the conventus or in a more expansive version, was designed to inject the leaven of the kingdom of God into the dough of society so that first people, then cities, and eventually nations would be disciples. My friends, without God, we can't do it. But the interesting thing is, without us, God won't do it. That's why your participation is so important. And let's take inspiration from the Apostle Paul. In Acts 19.11, we read, And all who live in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Who performed the miracles? God. Whose hands did he use? Paul. Where is God? Here. Where is Paul? He's not here. Who is here today? You and I. God wants to use you to perform extraordinary miracles. How did they work? It says the Bible that handkerchief or aprons were carried from Paul's body to the sick. He was working, making tents, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. Why? Because Paul was a minister in the marketplace. In other words, whatever instrument touched Paul became a vehicle for transformation. Whatever you do and touch, is potentially a vehicle for transformation. What does that mean today? Well, Jesus co-opted the ecclesia. He assembled people, even in as little as two or three in the conventus form. He also co-opted the office of apostle. And today you are part of a fleet of ships that are going to take God's kingdom to regions where the kingdom is unknown. My friend, without God we can, but with God we certainly can. Folks, you receive it by faith, but now you have to receive it in your heart. I'm gonna ask the pastor to join me here, my wife and Pastor Evelyn, and what we have received, we want you to have it. Do you want it? Would you like the anointing to go home today believing that you are the church, that Jesus is in you? And then you begin. The first step will not get you there, but will get you going. And God will do the rest. And so if you would like to receive this anointing, stand up where you are. And we're going to pray for an impartation. Teaching hits your mind and hopefully trickles down to your heart. An impartation hits your heart and changes your mind. Makes you pregnant with something new. So would you lift up your hands to the Lord like a soldier that is surrendering and receive this. Father God, in the name that is above all name, by the power of the Holy Spirit that is here, we pray baptism. 
baptize us right now with an anointing for miracles. Father, I take authority over every lie of the devil, of every doctrine that is false, that tells them they don't have enough faith. And I say, Lord, you have faith in them. And I tell them, saddle up, go and get them. Go there by faith. Receive now the anointing for extraordinary miracles. This I pray with the pastors in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And I say, go and give heaven to the world. In Jesus' name, and shout amen. Amen. Amen, amen and amen. Folks, let the anointing now percolate. Come all the way down to your soul. And faith without works is dead. So begin to pray for miracles. And if you need more information, get anointed for business, prayer evangel, ecclesia, get bone up. God bless you. Thank you. So, I, I, uh, first of all, there's a book table over there where you can get a bunch of material. Uh, I have just, uh, <laughs> because the potential of the kingdom coming is here. You know, Ed, what Ed said, uh, there's so many things that, you know, he articulated, but the scriptures talk about leaven, which looks really small and just slowly multiplies until it takes over the whole loaf. Right, And this weekend I asked the Lord uh, on Friday afternoon, I said, give me a word to understand what it is that you want to tell me about this. And the Lord said something very interesting. He said, follow me step by step. And he said, this is smaller than you think it's going to be. And it's also bigger than it's going to be. I, I think that's like yeast. That's like the mustard seed. That's like the apostles who are commissioned and anointed and appointed, at first they look really, really small, but then look what God did. So I, um, you know, I'm gonna have our team just um, play for a little bit, and I want you to just think back about what you've heard. I am a minister. The people where I go to school with the people that I go at work with, they are my congregation. Think about what what levels you're at and ask the Lord, what is my next step? What do I do tonight? And what do I do tomorrow morning? I think it's important that we put action right away into this. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you begin to speak to your sons and daughters. We are your workmanship created by Christ Jesus. Not uh, not by grace that any of us can boast, but we're, we're your workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which you're prepared in advance for us to do. So again, first of all, I am a pastor. I have a congregation. Ask God to show you your place where your congregation is and ask God, how do I pray for these people? Ask for specific faces to come to your mind. And um, because we received an impartation For the miraculous, ask God one way that the miraculous can show up where you are. If you 
got somebody or a situation that God's beginning to bring to mind, I just want you to extend your hands out and begin to pray right into that situation. Use those hands. Lord, touch our minds. Change our mind skins. We just ask for extraordinary miracles to begin to happen through these hands. With those sons, those daughters, with that aunt, with that boss, in that situation of unrighteousness. God, we just say you are worthy. And we give ourselves, at the beginning of the service, we, we hand it over the keys to you. And we ask, oh God, that you begin to conscript us for your purposes anew. And I just want to say, as the father of this house, Holy Spirit, we want to align our minds of what you have said about who you are and what you believe about who we are. And we ask that you change our minds so that we see ourselves as anointed and appointed in those places today. Forgive us when we thought of ourselves as too small. Forgive us when we've been... Um, intimidated by the wickedness and thought that there were giants in our marketplace. We stand into the fullness of what you've called us into and ask that you give us courage in the name of Jesus. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine on you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you shalom. And then Jesus said, all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So I commission you again this week to go out and be his sons and daughters, to be those pastors and peace, priests and prophets right where you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So grateful you're here. I want to encourage you to do something. Uh, you know, we, we need to do cleanup, but I want you to go and talk to somebody and say, these are two things that God spoke to me about today. And this is what I'm going to do about it. Okay? These are two things that God spoke to me about, and this is what I'm going to do about it. Bless you. And I just want to encourage... And I want to encourage you, if you're on, uh, there at home, I know our YouTube thing dropped out. Thank you for hanging with us. But you know, this is important for you to take and put into practice too. Uh, get together with your family and friends. Um, in these coming weeks, I think we'll have some practicals as to what this all means. But I want to encourage you, put some things into practice. Let's form in a group so that we can do this together. Bless you. Thank you. We'll see you soon.
Thank mm-hmm. you.